Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet more Warhammer 40k lore and the continuing war for Armageddon. So, you boys remember the orcs I teased you about weeks ago? You do? Couldn't think of anything else you say. Good, because all will soon be revealed. Well, soon, relatively speaking. It'll be in this video, at the very least. Possibly. As previously mentioned, the Imperial strategists were baffled by the large numbers of orcs landing in the fire wastes, also known colloquially as Hell and the place where everything burns all the time. It's basically Australia without the koala bears. Or, well, there might be koala bears, Imperial sources are silent on the matter, but if there are koala bears, they will almost certainly be on fire, which presumably will cut down their life expectancy rather drastically. Because there is precious little in the fire wastes that is not on fire. And though the orcs might not be the brightest of races, even they know that fire in overwhelming quantities is bad, and not particularly useful for much other than perhaps barbecues. But the beast had a cunning plan. Along with the rest of the soon-to-be char-broiled orcs, he had sent one of his most favoured lieutenants, the orc genius, quote-unquote, Orchimedes. Subtle. GW. Very subtle. Anywho, Orchimedes and his circles were left alone for weeks with no Imperial intervention. After all, the Imperium had absolutely no clue whatsoever in the almighty fuck of things what the green-skinned savages could possibly want in that blasted hellhole. And frankly, they had other things to worry about at the moment. For example, the rest of the savages falling from the skies. Or perhaps the first major engine battle of the war so far. The Titans and Skitarii Auxiliary of Legio Crucius clashed with the gargant mobs of Warlord Burzuruk and Warlord Scarfang over the Diabolus Manufactorum district, a huge area of endless factories, foundries, and machine shops, along with raw resource storage facilities that often covered several square kilometers, and of course massive waste dumps and slag heaps stretching hundreds of meters into the sky. The Gargants and Stompers strode into the district with hordes of orcs swarming around their legs, and engaged the god machines of the Mechanicus and their Skitarii cohorts in a ten-day running battle that would stretch all across the sprawling industrial complex. In the early days, the orcs made substantial gains into the district. The green mobs were heavily reinforced by mechanized walkers, as the warlords who led them were quite fascinated with things that go clink, clank, and ra ta 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 ta, -ta. Additionally, the Greenskins themselves are pretty dang tough, and that certainly worked to their advantage in this area. Imagine fighting through an active industrial complex. The decibel meter would be off the scale, pollution would lay in literal layers on the ground, and there would be a thick, cloying fog of pollution and smog. Active foundries and smelteries might be destroyed, molten metal running wild in the streets, storage containers of toxic chemicals could also be destroyed or damaged, and then of course comes the fact that the areas themselves were heavily industrialized and urbanized. And as you probably know, fighting in that kind of area tends to get close and brutal real fast. Basically, it was about as close to Orc Paradise as you can get. Well, outside of the Eye of Terror, at the very least. It was a bit more uncomfortable for the Humies, though. We don't know for sure, but the odds are pretty good that the area was being defended by Hive Militia regiments, and it's also quite likely that there would be formations of auxiliaries, essentially press-ganged civilians. The Militia, at least, would probably have access to rebreathers, and possibly some protection in the form of chemically resistant uniforms, like those handed out to the Steel Legion. But the Civvies, well, they would have virtually nothing issued to them, and would have to make do with whatever equipment they themselves could bring. The environment would in all due likelihood have been considerably less of a hindrance for the Skitari, however. The adepts of Mars are not particularly occupied with worker safety measures at the best of times, and the cybernetic Skitari even less so. 
Plus, they would have access to Auspex and Vox equipment, more than able to cut through the Smogon interference, along with sophisticated ways of locating the Orcs via various vision spectrums. The Militia and Civis, well... As far as the militia would be concerned, they might have squad vox, which means that one man in the group would carry a large vox caster on his back, which the officer could use to contact other squads. If they were lucky, they'd be equipped with this. They almost certainly would not have individual vox speeds. The civilians... Uh, no. <laughs> they would be unlikely to even receive something as simple as a squad vox. Perhaps larger formations might be issued with one. For example, a platoon leader might have access to a vox, and then be expected to just simply send his men off in the general direction that they've been requested to walk in. But still, they would not be equipped with much in the way of sensorum equipment, or even communications equipment and they would probably also suffer from considerable interference from the partially operational complex around them, even if they were handed some basic communication equipment. They are also, as previously mentioned, very unlikely to have been in possession of anything, really, in the terms of sophisticated scanning or auger equipment, and the civvies would be lucky if they got a flashlight. However, the infantry struggle pales rather quickly in comparison to the real stars of this particular battle, the God Machines. This was the first time the Imperium encountered the Orc equivalent machines during the Second War in the form of various sizes of Gargants. Legio Crucius could field the 15 Titans, with the heaviest probably being a Warlord. The rest of the demi legion would be made up primarily of Reaver Titans and Warhounds. Facing them were an equal number of Gargants of unknown size and power. Considering the final outcome, it seems quite reasonable to assume that the two forces were relatively evenly matched. As mentioned previously, the Orc had made significant gains in the first few days of the battle. This was eventually halted with the arrival of Crucius and the Mechanicus. The militia and auxiliary had been no match for the Orcs in the tight confined spaces of the industrial complex, where they would essentially be fighting melee and hand-to-hand -hand with the Orcs, a situation in which the big burly greenskins would have a rather considerable advantage. But the Skitarii proved to be an entirely different calibre of opponent. The Skitarii probably numbered around 40,000, while the Orcs numbered at least 140,000, and quite probably upwards of a quarter million. Numbers of militia and auxiliary are unknown, but to be fair, they probably weren't of much help against the heavily walker-focused orc horde supported by Gargans in this kind of urban fighting anyways, and after several days of fighting the orc hordes all by themselves, any numbers they might have had, well, let's just say that they would probably have considered decimation to be a considerably more humane option than what they actually got put through. In response to being so severely outnumbered, the Mechanicus adopted a simple yet elegant tactic to counter their enemies' vast superiority when it comes to sheer bodies. With superior aspects and scanning technology, they could easily keep a track of the clanking orc walkers and their crudely organized warbands, even through the near zero visibility conditions created from uncontrolled fires and various other hazardous materials that had been pumped out into the air after everything had gotten destroyed. The Mechanicus would establish themselves in an area, and begin engaging all Orcs within range, with ranged fire, and draw them towards their positions, using for example harassing fire, scouts and skirmishes to draw in Orcs from a large area around them. Then, expertly judging when the Orcs had reached their maximum numbers without interfering with the Skitarii cohort's acceptable chances for escape, the formation would be a hasty retreat along pre-planned routes, leaving the raging greenskins bottled up and gathered in vast numbers in the position the Skitarii had recently marked for the coup de grace. On a signal from the Skitari Alpha, every available Titan nearby would drown the position in a deluge of super heavy weapons fire. I have no doubt that the various remaining militia and auxiliary forces were used in much the same way, though probably without the retreat part. 
The tactic quickly thinned out the Orc Horde and allowed the Titans to advance with confidence, not having to worry about sudden invasions of Greenskins pouring up their legs, ripping open various hatches, and butchering the crew. However, that was just the opening skirmishes. The real battle was about to begin. The god machines of the Imperium clashed with the hulking idols of Gork and Mork in a days-long engine battle, with the massive machines stalking each other through the streets and Manifactorum districts. At this point, the constant fires and chemical spills had begun to baffle even the Titans' augurs. In many cases, the gargantuan walkers would only become aware of each other when they were within a few kilometers, knife fighting range by Titan standards. And indeed, many Titans returned to their Mechanicus repair pens with their armor rent asunder by massive gargant melee weapons. Imagine a city block sized chainsaw, and you're not too far off. It therefore became imperative for both sides to advance their infantry out ahead of their titans. At these relatively short ranges, who's going to kill who is largely a crapshoot, as the first volley of monstrously sized shells and Nova Heart energy weapons would probably cripple, if not outright destroy, the target. Therefore, to alleviate the burden upon the god machines, the Skitarii attempted to push out ahead so that they could relay targeting information back to the Titans and let them engage the Orc Walkers at a far more favourable range. The Orcs, in turn, rather unfortunately, began to surge back into combat against the Skitarii. While the horde had been thinned, it was far from spent. The Greenskins attacked with the ruthless savagery and refused any and all advance attempts made by the Skitari. After ten days of near constant fighting, the Manifactorum district was doing its best impression of a blasted moonscape, and was put well and truly out of commission. The Imperium emerged victorious, with the Orcs had driven out with massive casualties amongst the warbands. The Skitari had fared considerably better than the green-skinned savages, only seeing substantial casualties in the last few days of fighting when trying to range ahead of the Titans. As for the militia and auxiliary, well, let's just say that the area would need some repopulating after the war. But hey, civvies, who gives a fuck? Far more importantly, what happened with the Omnisaya's giant toys? Out of a total of 15, six titans were outright destroyed in the fighting, and several more required months of repairs. It uh, was an uncomfortable number. The orcs had lost eight gargants, with several more seen limping from the city. An exceptionally costly week and a half for the Legio, the loss of a third of the Demi Legion's Titans in a single protracted engagement was rare to say the absolute least. And what's worse, the losses had been inflicted by mere orcs. Usually, Imperial Titans are at a distinct advantage against Gargants, but that advantage existed in their superior targeting solutions and Augur Arrays, along with their ability to deliver death at a massive range. The first two were of little use in the battle. Infrared and heat sensors were practically worthless. Long-range radar was constantly baffled due to the immense quantities of chemicals and minerals blasted into the air. Particles of ferrite, carbon, and iron creating a crude distortion effect, making it very difficult to distinguish between a factory block containing puppies, babies, sugars, spice, and everything nice, or, well, contained at least before, you know, fire and the war and the... You know, that got dark really quick. I wonder what those puppies were even doing in a factory district. Never mind. The point is that it is hard to distinguish between a harmless building and a gargant bristling with murder and violent intent. And frighteningly few puppies, by the way. Unless you count the snotlings, I suppose. Hmm. The Manifactorum was damaged well beyond immediate repair. But it had been kept out of the Orcs' dirty mittens, and trust you me, the Orcs have considerably lower requirements for getting a factory up and running again than the Imperium. Even blasted as it was, it probably wouldn't have taken the Orcs all that long to get it kicking again, and at this point the Imperium could really not afford to give the Orcs any opportunity to start constructing vast quantities of vehicles on planet. 
And so, with their main assault thwarted, the orcs turned to the Speed Freaks. They committed several war bands of said Speed Freaks to circumvent the Manufactorum district and establish a crude cordon around the Manufactorum district and the nearby Hive Infernus. The Titans were far too battered to lead any attempts to break the ring of roaring engines and slapdash bikes, but nevertheless it was decided that an attempt to break the encirclement was to be made. Mechanized troops, presumably mostly Steel Legion units, formed up a spearhead, aiming to break through the circling greenskins, and then repulse any subsequent attempts to re-establish the siege. The mechanized regiments were guided by a few regiments of Ash Waste Militia, and supported by the highly expendable Sevlar Chem Dogs. Doubtlessly, the idea was for the Steel Legion to break out, then dump off the dirty druggies, and leave the hard task of holding the ground to them. The Chimeras and Lehman Russes of the Steel Legion made short work of the Speed Freaks in the initial engagements, while supported by the Guns of Infernus, and pushed into the Wastes. To start with, it would appear as if the counterattack had succeeded. It seemed that the Orcs had overextended themselves, rushing ahead to complete the encirclement without bringing up sufficient resources to protect them from a counterthrust. What the Imperial commanders were forgetting, however, was that they were not tangling with some ordinary war boss. They were dealing with the great beast of Armageddon, and Garzagul does not make mistakes like that. Once the Imperials had moved well out of the range of Infernus's heavy guns, several more Speed Freak warbands moved in behind the Imperials. At the same time that this was happening, the orcs that had scattered from the original engagement turned around and engaged the lead elements of the spearhead. These speed freak warbands then began attempting to cut the various regiments away from one another and separate them. The more mobile Steel Legion was able to extricate themselves relatively intact, but at least one full regiment of Sevlar Chem Dogs were cut off and completely wiped out to the last drug addict. The remaining forces were ordered to withdraw for now, as the Imperial Command was not willing to risk further troops in what was clearly a losing battle, and so they abandoned the attempts to break out for now. As the officers in Infernus readjusted their plans and pondered how they could break the siege, the situation went from kinda bad to violently and highly non-consensual sex in a dark alley bad. A far larger orc horde was moving around the Polydius mountain range, with several gargants leading the charge. Perhaps even worse than the massive god machines was the fact that the personal glyph of Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka could clearly be seen painted on the towering orc war machines. And you know what they say, when it's raining, it pours, and on this day the gods were well and truly pissing on Hive Infernus, as Gazgul's massive space hulk could barely be made out as it lowered its behemoth hulk into low orbit, and began a devastating orbital bombardment of Infernus. This, along with the rapidly spreading rumours that the Great Beast himself was approaching, put a severe dent in the civilians' morale, and they began to flee, desperately and somewhat pointlessly, into the surrounding wastes. I say pointless because that was, of course, the area that was at this point in time completely and utterly filled to the bloody brim with orc speed freaks. So that was rather silly things, but hey, beer and all. The Adeptus Arbites figured that they had to restore order, the Imperial way. And how do you fight fear? Well, with a little bit of good old-fashioned Imperial authority of your very own. With shotguns and electroprods, the Adeptus Arbites marched through the cities, and anyone seen fleeing or refusing orders to return to their designated defense militia zones got shot on sight and left for the orcs. Everyone else inside the hive checked their weapons and prepared to sell their lives as dearly as they could. We are now entering the second month of the war. Around about this time, the orcs reached the hive Hell's Reach and Tempestora, and began attacking the man-made mountains. 
the greatest of the two assaults struck at Hell's Reach. The first assault wave was relatively easily repelled by the Hive's defences, but the Orcs had come to stay, and launched wave after wave attacks upon the walls grinding down the defenders' ability to resist with sheer weight of numbers. Eventually, after well over a week of combat, the big guns of Infernus began to fall silent. Not because they ran out of ammunition, or targets, much less so, but because the ammo could simply not be brought up fast enough. In response, the orcs brought forth several massive gargants, and used their concentrated firepower to breach the massive hive walls and allow the orc hordes to flood into the hive. Now, a quick little side note here. In the book Hell's Reach, it seems to suggest that there were hundreds of Gargans attacking Hell's Reach. This is probably as a result of the different classifications of Gargans. In the numbers video, I assumed the numbers of Gargans were probably warlord size or bigger, and so they were worthy of a special mention, but there could still be hundreds of quote unquote Gargans attacking Hell's Reach, but the vast majority of them would be considerably smaller, possibly the equal of a Warhound, but probably they will vary in size and power from that of a super heavy tank and up to a warlord class. Most of them were probably relatively small, roughly around the power of a super heavy tank, and they could be available in pretty damn huge numbers. The orcs themselves would usually refer to a gargant, quote-unquote, of that size as a stomper, but, well, the Imperium wouldn't know that, now would they? Additionally, the orcs had access to one real monster of a gargant, a single mega gargant. A walker comparable in power to an Imperator. But anyways, back to the whole massive fuck-off hole-in-the-wall thing. Legio Invigilata was prepared to defend the first breach and turned the first few Gargans into molten slag as they tried to pass. But several other breaches were swiftly made and the orcs began pouring through. Soon, the Titan Legion Invigilata was forced to begin falling back alongside the rest of the defenders. Over the course of the next 18 days, the Imperial Defenders, bolstered by the Black Templars and Invigilata, executed a masterfully planned and executed strategy. The Hive had been separated into hundreds of pre-planned defensive lines that had been prepared and fortified well in advance. Bunkers had been dug along roadways, minefields had been placed, buildings had been set to detonate the moment they fell into Orc hands, an entire road could be collapsed deep into the underhive below. The Imperial Defenders would hold the Orcs at one line until put under substantial pressure. Then, before the line was put in danger of breaking, the troops would be withdrawn in stages to the next line and the old line demolished with pre-placed debt charges, hopefully catching a few Orcs in the blasts as well. This might sound simple, but trust me, disengaging from an enemy, and especially one as aggressive as the Orcs, is no mean feat. To then execute an ordered and disciplined relocation to new defensive positions on top of that is downright impressive. And the defenders of Armageddon carried out this rather challenging set of operations time and time and time again over the course of 18 days while also bringing up supplies, establishing supply depots, and rotating tired units out of the line and fresh units in whenever available. Although this became increasingly rare as the war dragged on. In many cases, units would have to stay at the front line for days upon end. Now imagine this yourself. You have been fighting, virtually without stop, against an enemy as savage and relentless as the Orcs, while continuously carrying out extremely complicated and delicate maneuvers, day in and day out. The sheer level of physical and mental exhaustion would be absolutely devastating. And all this was done in order to keep the orcs away from the so-called Hell's Highway, a massive main arterial roadway leading into the heart of the hive. 
and eventually other hives beyond. If the orcs were allowed to reach this highway in considerable numbers, Hive Hellsreach would be as good as doomed, as it would very quickly be overwhelmed, as the orcs could bring their full weight of numbers to bear throughout the Hive. The defenders held on for 18 days. Longer than most had thought possible, but eventually the defensive line buckled and was breached. The moment this happened, the defenders could no longer fall back by increments. The orcs were streaming through and engaging the second line before the Imperials could reach it. Instead, all the Imperial troops currently engaged with the orcs were immediately ordered to disengage and initiate a general retreat to Hell's Highway. It was no longer feasible to hold the incremental defensive lines, and any attempt to do so would only risk further troops being cut off by the orcs and destroyed. It was now important that Hell's Highway be held with all hands. And now shit really began to hit the proverbial fan. Steel Legion troops and Hive Militia desperately held on to any and all choke points, barricading exits and entrance ramps, and attempting to block off as much of the various on and off roads as possible. But now every barricade overrun and every blockade swept aside had a knock-on effect. Basically, once the Orcs were outside, they only had one attack path, so their numbers could be somewhat stimid, as there's of course a limit on how many Orky Borkies you can cram into any one given area. Now that they had reached the highway, however, that one path turned into a potential thousands of paths. Every single path was of course heavily defended and viciously held, but every time the defenders were overrun, a new path would open up, which again meant that the size of the battlefield increased, which in turn meant that more orcs could be brought up and thrown into the fighting. As previously theorized, the rate at which the orcs gained grounds increased exponentially with every roadway they gained access to. Things were looking pretty damn grim indeed. Meanwhile, you remember those orcs again? The ones camping out in Bushfire Valley? Orchimedes had been quite the busy piece of fungus, and the fruits of his labour, or the mushrooms potentially, were about to be revealed in a grand fashion. Thousands of massive orc submersibles rose out of the polluted seas of Armageddon and made landings around and occasionally even directly inside of the dock districts of High of Hellsreach and Tempestora. This came as a complete and utter surprise to the Imperial commanders. The seas of Armageddon are extremely polluted and frequently wracked with cataclysmic storms. On top of this, Armageddon has no deep sea navy. It has a tiny number of Coast Guard equivalent vessels to harass poor honest smugglers, but nothing capable of detecting, or much less fighting, thousands of orc submersibles. The harbour of the two hives had been mined to some extent, but during the last war the orcs had made little to no attempt to take the hives from the sea, so seaside defences were few and far between. Additionally, the extremely polluted nature of the oceans of Armageddon means that sea mines must be used sparingly, as the pollution will actually eat through the chains used to anchor the mines, and eventually even eat inside the mines themselves. This basically means that thousands of mines could be cut loose and sent adrift on the seas of Armageddon, which as you can probably imagine is a bit of a danger to shipping, and there is a fairly considerable shipping trade on Armageddon. There are massive chemically treated tankers that travel back and forth between the hives, and even these vessels will routinely need to have their outer hulls completely restored. Any kind of permanent deep sea navy would be ludicrously expensive, and frankly not really worth it. It's practically impossible to run a pirating business on Armageddon, because you need to have access to large-scale dockyards to continuously repair the ships. As such, it has never really been a need to do this kind of stuff. And additionally, who the fucking thought that the orcs would land on the planet and then build a goddamn submersible navy <laughs> and use that navy to attack two hives? I mean, come on now. 
the sheer amount of resources, of manpower, of perseverance, not to mention, of course, that this was a near suicidal plot. They are now stuck in crudely built orc submersibles beneath one of the most heavily polluted seas in the Imperium, rapidly eating through the outer hull. The God Emperor alone knows how many orcs were drowned during this maneuver, but the number probably stretches well and truly into the thousands. But it is as I always say, there is always more orcs. At Hive Tempestora, surprise was total. The first the commanders of the Hive knew about the Orc invasion was when gargantuan submersibles burst forth from the seas and rammed themselves onto the shore and indeed straight into the docking districts of Tempestora, unloading thousands of Orcs straight into the heart of the Great Hive. They quickly made massive inroads into the Hive from the docking districts and began overrunning Imperial positions and tangling with the supply lines. Tempestora, of course, had also been under attack from the outside, just like Hive Hellsreach. They had been able to hold out a bit better as they were not assaulted by as large a force, but they in turn lacked the support of the Astartes. And so when the orcs burst forth from the sea, they had no rapid response force that was hard-hitting enough to halt them. Within a few more days, Hive Tempestora was completely overrun and lost to the orcs. At Hive's Hell's Reach, meanwhile, the defenders had been sorely battered. Practically all the city's regiments had been reduced to well below half strength. Many had been reduced to the size of single brigades or even individual companies, and a few had been completely wiped out. Legio Invigilata had also suffered heavy casualties with several god machines destroyed and some crippled to the point of being combat ineffective. And with no repair pens on hand, they were as good as dead as far as the battle was concerned. The Legion had deployed most of its titans along the Hemlock River in support of the Salamanders and Imperial Guard troops. Out of a total of 60 machines, 19 were at Hell's Reach, including the Legion's Princeps Majoris, Sara Mankion, and her Imperator-class titan, Storm Herald. Of the original 100 Black Templars, 75 remained. And what was considerably worse is that out of the 25 fallen Astartes, only 13 had their gene seed removed intact. Overall, the Orcs had taken control of circa 50% of the Hive at this point, and were even now reinforced by amphibious landings similar to the ones that had taken place at Tempestora. However, there was one crucial difference. Hell's Reach had been warned that something was approaching. Several Promethean drilling platforms located far outside of Hell's Reach had gone silent. This had warned the authorities in Hell's Reach that something was approaching from the sea. And perhaps more importantly, at Hive's Hell's Reach, the Orcs were in for a real fight. Not only did the defenders count a company of Black Templars amongst their ranks, but that single company of crazed zealots were led by a reclusiarch Grimaldus. A man with an adamantium rod of pure emperor bothering so far up his ass you can see the shine when he speaks. This man is so utterly and unflinchingly stubborn that he quite literally berated a woman into coming back from the dead. That's right, this man is so talented in the arts of shame and blame, he can literally resurrect people by bitching at them. And if he possesses, as he most certainly does, a rage strong enough to fuel language so harsh, it shatters the very boundaries of life and death, just imagine what that level of butthurt can do if handed a blunt object. May the God Emperor have mercy on the orcs, cause Grim Al Darkus will not. Blissfully unaware of the overwhelming levels of blunt force trauma that lurked just ahead, the orcs surged off the beaches and docks and into the heart of Hell's Reach. Just as in Tempestora, virtually all of the Hive's defences were facing outwards, and currently occupied with fighting for their very lives throughout half of the Hive. 
and the internal logistical network was stretched to the breaking point, just providing ammunition to the defenders. And now that very system was under direct attack. Total collapse seemed inevitable. But unlike Tempestora, Hell's Reach had the Black Templars. Hell's Reach had also received, as mentioned, a bit of warning from the Promethean platforms on the coast. And this gave the defenders a small window of time to prepare. Considering the life and death struggle currently engulfing half of the Hive, the defenders could not spare any guard or militia units. Instead, Hell's Reach dock workers were armed, quote unquote, and organized into auxiliary formations of some 40 to 50 men, led by a single veteran or preferably a stormtrooper. This rabble was then thrown at the orcs in great numbers, and subsequently eaten to death almost as fast as the Imperium could shovel them in. To begin with, of course, they at least had the advantage of position, as they knew the orcs were coming, and they knew the docks. They knew the choke points, they established defensive positions, laid traps, approaches were mined, and outlining buildings rigged to blow. Hell's Reach had gone through this song and dance before. And considering the time available, miracles were performed in preparing the docks to receive the Orc Invader. Thanks to these efforts, the overwhelmingly civilian in nature formations achieved what Imperial commanders would refer to as a base level of success. In other words, they succeeded in dying slowly enough to limit the Orc advance to the outer dock workings. Their brutal dismemberment served to concentrate and corral the Orcs into what could charitably be referred to as a front line, which in return let the power-armored zealots of the Black Templars run a screaming up and down said line, butchering anything stupid enough to not run away. There was, however, one small problem. The very same men and women whose visceral demise was slowing the orc down were the exact same people expected to keep the logistical system operational, and dead men, unfortunately, lug no crates. And so the defences began suffering in other places as well. The Hive had plenty of ammunition stored away, but the orcs were coming so thick and fast that the various units' own stocks were being depleted faster than they were being replenished and with a sizable portion of the people carrying that ammunition being carved into sizable portions themselves, this situation was getting worse by the minute. After 37 days, the hive still stood defiant, but balanced on a razor's edge. The defenders were in desperate need of a break, a lull in the fighting to reorganize and resupply in peace. But sadly, the orcs did not appear willing to oblige. Meanwhile, millions of miles away in a distant galaxy, or, well, not really, but in space anyways, the orcs were still smothering the planet beneath a massive blockade of orc ships, continuously landing more troops both via landers and teleportation arrays. Some of the ships were hanging in low orbit, conducting said reinforcements operations, and others were delivering fire support, while other ships were simply just blasting away at the planet below because, well, they were bored, and this was pretty amusing to them. Whilst other ships again shocked through the void in high orbit, guarding against attack. And make no mistake, the Imperial Navy don't give up easy. Admiral Parole, now reinforced by even more ships arriving in system in answer to Armageddon's plea for aid, had begun harassing the Orc fleet. Once separated from Gazgul's direct command, the Orcs who had previously pursued the Navy so doggedly throughout the outermost reaches of the system quickly began to lose cohesion, and were getting picked apart by the Navy's raiders. This had given the Admiral enough time and space to reorganize and begin assimilating the reinforcements. With the Navy's strength reformed, and after several weeks of absence, the time had finally come for the Imperium to reignite the Void War. Though still not anywhere near the numbers required to engage the Orcs in a protracted all-out fleet battle, so instead the Admiral began launching series of raids against the Orcs. Always striking from different directions, the Navy would approach Armageddon at maximum velocity and then skim across the Orc fleet, engaging any and all targets of opportunity without letting themselves be drawn into a lengthy engagement. These tactics preserved the Navy's strength, but the damage they inflicted was relatively minor. It was a tactic of attrition. 
the retentions of one's own forces whilst whittling away at the enemies became the main mantra. This did, however, mean that the Navy had no way to ensure the safe delivery of the newly arrived Imperial Guard and Astartes troops. Because to do that, the Navy would have to break the blockade in one area and then pin themselves to that area for an extended period of time while the transport ships unloaded. The Astartes could deploy quickly via drop pods and thunderhawks, requiring only a few hours in orbit's maximum, launch and then disengage. The Imperial Guard's bulk transports, however, would require at least a few days in stable orbit to fully deploy and that is only if we assume the transports were equipped with assault landers. These huge transports were kinda like Thunderhawks, in that they are launched from the ship as a vessel all of their own, and then head planetside under its own power and at a considerable speed. It can carry an entire regiment of infantry, and is often armed with enough artillery to support the landing. But these vessels are rare and highly prized, so it is unlikely that there was a more than a few available. Additionally, the Imperial Navy's bulk transports can contain dozens of regiments. It would take probably as much as two to three days to empty one entire landing craft. And any landing craft that were not equipped with these would have to transport down the troops by massive, slow and unmaneuverable bulk landers. Think something along the lines of two oil tankers strapped together and dropped from orbit, and you're pretty close to a bulk transport. These things could take multiple regiments and transport heavy armour, but they are also big, fat, slow, and massively easy to hit, putting their passengers at great risk if the local space is not tightly controlled. Preferably, the Navy should also be in low orbit, protecting the landers with orbital bombardment and suppressing enemy AAA batteries, and with fighter escort deployed. To put it bluntly, the operation would probably take at least days and probably weeks. Meanwhile, the Navy could not hope to stand and fight for more than a few hours tops, and even that would come at a considerable risk to the Navy's remaining fighting forces. As such, there was simply no way to bring in extra troops without risking the entirety of the Imperial Navy's presence in orbit. It was crazy, it was suicidal, and it could not be done. Except possibly by the Astartes. Enter the Salamanders. Their chapter master, Tu Shan, was currently engaged fighting along the Hemlock River, but he had heard about the plight of Hellsreach and Tempestora. He was obviously too late to do anything for Tempestora, but he ordered a sergeant by the name of Vireth, that was currently in orbit commanding a strike cruiser, to make for Hellsreach and dump down a bunch of salamanders directly into the hive. The maneuver was risky, to put it rather bluntly, and the strike cruiser took considerable damage in the execution of said maneuver. But the maneuvers were successful, and 70 Adeptus Astartes of the Salamander chapter were fired out of the strike cruiser in drop pods. Hive Hellsreach had been ordered to cease any and all anti-aircraft defences in the dockwards facing area for a limited amount of time, allowing the drop pods to come down safely and reinforce the Black Templars and civilian auxiliaries. Together with these forces, the Salamanders were just barely capable of maintaining a solid defensive line, and keeping the Orcs from breaking out into the Hive and past the defensive lines. If this had happened, the Imperial Guard defenders that were currently holding Hell's Highway would find themselves attacked in the rear by more Orc forces, and that would almost certainly have led to the complete collapse of Hive's Hell's Reach. However, the situation was still incredibly precarious, and it was decided that it was no longer possible to defend Hell's Highway. As such, there was only one thing left to do. All the Imperial Guard, Militia, and civilian forces were ordered to retreat back to strategically important locations and civilian population centers.
which they would hold against the Orc Hordes for as long as possible. Effectively, the Imperium would abandon the Hive, resigning it to its fate while desperately attempting to protect what remained of its population, strategic locations, centre of governments, and of course religious centres. As such, they fell back to the Hab blocks, as previously mentioned, which had already been uh, fortified quite heavily against the Orcs. It has to be remembered that, of course, after the First War, there was a certain fear that the beast would return. As such, the civilian population had been drilled in what to do if this was to occur. These heavily populated hive spires had been turned into mini fortresses, filled with makeshift traps and defensive positions. One of the most popular of these was an easy to make landmine, where you would take a single heavy bolter shell, which was ammunition readily available, it would then be attached to a detonation mechanism designed specifically for this purpose, which would screw onto the bottom of the bolt shell. This two piece mine would then be buried in the ground so that the tip was just showing, and then the mine was hidden. When an orc stepped on this contraption, the additional firing mechanism that was screwed onto the bottom of the round, which contained a pressure sensor, would go off and fire the heavy bolt around directly upwards. With any luck, this would send the bolt around screaming straight through the orc's leg, exploding somewhere in his groin region. And while orcs might be tough, having the equivalent of a 75 caliber high explosive grenade detonate in your ass, well, that's the kind of explosive surprise butt sex likely to put even an orc on his backside. And of course, the Imperium was also prepared to sacrifice parts of the Hive in its defense. Several Hive blocks, just like during the First War, had been rigged to explode. Once the Orcs reached the topmost level of the Hive block, the last man alive would detonate the explosives, collapsing the entire block structure. If it was done properly and enough high explosives were available, one small detonation pack was placed in an altar to the Emperor. The last survivor was expected to pray at that altar while detonating the explosives, which would also ease his passage into the afterlife. If, however, such a surplus of ammunition was not available, don't worry, the fall is going to kill him just as surely as the explosion would. The Hive might in all due practicality be lost, but the population of Hell's Reach was going to make damn sure that the Orcs would not have much left of it with which to celebrate their victories. And as if all that wasn't quite bad enough, it was about to get just a little bit worse. Because remember children, it can always get worse. To the north of Hive's Hell's Reach was a smaller industrial hive known as Stygia. It was defended by a far smaller garrison, however, it had a considerable presence of Mechanicus defenders, and it had been able to hold out for over a month, all in its lonesome against the orcs surrounding it, until the orcs finished building a gargant. The biggest gargant ever built on Armageddon, and quite likely, the biggest to ever be built. It was dubbed the Godbreaker, and it was even larger than an Imperator-class Titan. It took it only three and a half hours to completely level the industrial hive of Stygia. After that bout of devastation, it headed for the closest center of Imperial control, Hive Hellsreach. On the way towards the Hive, it was intercepted by Storm Herald, along with a contingent of other Titans, including a Warlord and two Warhound Titans. The two smaller Warhounds were sent out ahead to scout what exactly was approaching. Since the heat signature was so large, it did not fit the description of any known Orc vehicle. Both of the Warhounds were annihilated before acquiring a visual confirmation on what exactly was approaching, but, well, they knew at this point that they'd had remarkable amounts of firepower. Making a Warhound do a vanishing trick is not particularly easy. They might be the lightest of the Titan classes, but they are still protected by ship-class void shields. They don't go poof easy. 
After the destruction of the Warhound, the rest of Storm Herald's escort were annihilated in short order, leaving only the Storm Herald and the Godbreaker. If all things were equal, Storm Herald would probably have had a considerable advantage over Godbreaker, both in terms of range, accuracy, and firepower. However, Storm Herald had been fighting for over a month at this point. Its crew were exhausted, and the machine itself had been pushed to its absolute limits. Storm Herald's Principe was almost completely gone. She had suffered such overwhelming physical and psychical trauma that Storm Herald's machine spirit was almost overwhelming her, threatening to rip her very spirit from her body and pull her back down into the machine consciousness, where all Primarchs eventually must go. Storm Herald's battle groups were in fact preparing to return to their mass conveyance landers to rearm, replenish, and rest. What they did not, of course, know was that these landers themselves had been lost hours previously. As it was, Storm Herald almost managed to destroy Godkiller. However, the stress got the better of its crew. With their Principe almost completely incapacitated, the chief gunnery officer broke at the last moment and fired their last possible salvo too early. The massive weapon's main stabilization system had not been able to fully bring itself back online after the last shot had been fired. The machine itself was just as exhausted as the crew, and it acted far too slowly. The chief weapons officer fired the weapon anyways, and the gargantuan force released from the weapon pushed the gun itself off target and left the gargant with only a scratch. In the next few moments, Godkiller brought its gargantuan melee weapon down upon Storm Herald and split the Titan from head to groin. And as if the loss of an Imperator class Titan was not bad enough, the Princeps personal pledge to defend Hell's Reach was the only thing that kept the Legion in Hell's Reach. With her death, command of the remaining titans in Hell's Reach fell to Princeps Amasat, which ordered the remaining god machines to withdraw from the city and rejoin the bulk of the Legion along the River Hemlock. Hell's Reach had just lost its one and only weapon that could possibly stop God Killer. Meanwhile, back in Hive Hell's Reach, the Imperial Defenders had retreated to various positions of strategic significance. The Black Templars had decided to retreat to the Temple of the Emperor Ascendant, an attempt to hold out there against the overwhelmingly superior Orc Horde. Along with other Imperial Defenders, they managed to hold out for a while longer, and they could potentially have held out for maybe as much as a week or two. The Adeptus Sororitas tasked with defending the temple took no part in this final battle. They were deeper inside the temple, guarding the catacombs, which were their ultimate charge. One might ask why they wouldn't simply fight to keep the orcs out of the catacombs in the first place, but, well, Adeptus Sororitas. They are not exactly particularly flexible when it comes to their orders. As such, the remaining 25 Black Templars and whatever Imperial Guard forces they could scrounge together was all that was holding the temple, and Godkiller was heading in their direction. Their fate appeared sealed, and it would have been if it was not for one final gambit made by Reclusiarch Grimaldus. Before the invasion had begun, he had dispatched his chief tech priest, Jurizion, to reawaken one of the biggest and baddest weapons available on Armageddon. Ordinatus Armageddon. The Mechanicus had sent for Principes to guide the weapon, but they had not arrived in time. Normally, the rousing of such a gargantuan weapon would take months of ceremony and various incantations. They did not have time for any of that. Jurizion forcefully hacked his way into the fortress that was protecting the Ordinatus Armageddon, overcoming the various security measures meant to protect the weapon, roused it from its slumber, and drove it out all by himself towards Hive Hellsreach. 
Normally, a weapon like this would require a crew of a few thousand to operate. And if you're wondering just what an Ordinatus is, well, it is one of the very, very old fluff piece weapons. Essentially, it is spaceship level weaponry mounted on a ground carriage. In this case, a Nova cannon. To give you a general approximation of something that we might have in real history, imagine the German railway guns of the Second World War. Now imagine those things being able to travel around on the battlefield by themselves, fully self-propelled, and firing those gargantuan guns right into the enemy. And you've got a general idea, although a Nova cannon is even more powerful. A Nova Cannon is usually used to obliterate battleships. To fire a weapon of this magnitude against a ground target is not mere overkill. It is cataclysmic and one-sided rape. It does not merely destroy the target it was fired against, it destroys every single piece of terrain within a dozen kilometers radius. It is like a nuclear fucking weapon on wheels that can be fired again and again and again. And while it lacks the defensive capabilities of a proper titan, having very little in the ways of void shields or outright defences, it really doesn't need them. The thing is absolutely loaded with auspex and scanning gear, allowing it to acquire firing solutions at ranges that even titans would consider to be utterly fucking ludicrous. But it was almost not to be at all. The remainder of Legio Invigilata encountered the Armageddon as it was approaching Hive Hellsreach. The Mechanicus crew of the Titans, of course, were outraged at what they saw as a desecration of the Ordinata's Armageddon, and threatened to destroy the weapon along with its driver, the Techmarine Jurisian, if he would not give it over to their command. Jurisian, on his side, called their bluff, betting that they would not risk firing upon such a sacred relic. Instead, he asked the remainder of the Legion to advance into the city and distract Godkiller for just long enough for Jurisian to take aim at the massive orc gargant and send it into the scrapyard afterlife. Reluctantly, the Titans obliged. The remainder of Legio Invigilata in Hellsreach was practically annihilated in a short yet violent engagement. It took Jurisian quite a while to acquire the Gargant as a target. Now, that might seem insane, considering the sheer size of the thing, but remember once again, the Ordinatus was supposed to be manned by a crew of hundreds at the very least, and thousands if fully operational. Jurisian was doing all of the work by himself, and a tech marine of lesser skill and talent would not have been able to even drive the weapon, much less fire it accurately. However, although it cost the sacrifice of what remained of Legio Invigilata in Hellsreach, the weapon was brought to bear and discharged against Godbreaker. For the merest fraction of a second, it appeared as if the Gargant's multiple layers of void shields would be just enough to resist even the enormous forces unleashed by the Ordinatus. But the damage it had sustained from Storm Herald finally told. One void shield collapsed, and then in a millisecond another one, and another one, and another one, until the humongous orc gargant lay fully exposed to the battleship annihilating power of Ordinatus Armageddon. The orc monstrosity vanished from Hive Hell's Reach along with a couple kilometers of the hive itself. Unfortunately, the Temple of the Emperor Ascendant was far too close for safety, and took severe damage as the Orc Gargant was destroyed. All the defenders were presumed dead, but after a few days, Grimaldus and a handful of survivors crawled their way out of the destroyed temple, and were called the Saviors of Hell's Reach. After seeing their icon of Gork and Mork annihilated in such a spectacular fashion, the orcs broke and ran.
scattering into the wastes beyond, and thousands, hundreds of thousands possibly, scattered into the underhive, into the maze-like structure at the hive's roots. It would take months, if not years, or even decades, to root them all out, but for now, the hive had been reclaimed. Reinforcements were brought in from nearby Imperial forces, and the rocks nearby were eventually destroyed by the combined might of the Salamanders and several regiments of Steel Legion armoured regiments. Hell's Reach had held, by the slightest of margins, but held it had. It had been reduced to 5% of its pre-invasion industrial capacity. Its population had been beyond decimated. Its defenders were virtually destroyed. It was assumed that maybe as little as 11% of the total Imperial forces present before the battle began were alive to see the end of it. If Hell's Reach ever recovers, it's going to take a very long time. Around the rest of the planet, events were unfolding in much the same way. The Imperium had been pushed to the absolute brink, but it appeared as if in most of the recent engagements, the Imperial forces would just barely be able to squeak out victories. Along the Hemlock River, Chapter Master Tu Shan and the remaining Titans of Invigilata had managed to hold the river against multiple Orc tribes. The Salamander's first company, under the direct command of Chapter Master Tu Shan, had managed to hold a strategic bridge over the river for multiple days against an entire tribe of Orc speed freaks. 100 fireborn salamanders against thousands of orcs and their mechanized transports. Quite the feat indeed. Whilst the orcs had almost completely exhausted their reserves, and would begin to slowly but surely be whittled down, and with the continuous arrival of Imperial and Navy forces, it was very unlikely that any further orc forces from out-system would be able to arrive in one piece. Additionally, Adeptus Biologists had deployed a new and terrifying weapon to Armageddon, a specially developed nerve gas that attacked only the orcs had been released in a hive hell's reach to try and root out some of the orcs that had gone to ground underneath the hive, in the underhive and the maze. Huge numbers of orcs were found dead in the subsequent weeks. The gas itself was heavy and would sink downwards inside of the hive, and it had only a 1% chance of mutating to human lethal levels, which was deemed to be acceptable. And with that, I will end this second video on the War for Armageddon. We have one more major event to cover, and we're also going to have to talk about, of course, the outcome of the war. But for now, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.